Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to join the 10th Self Self Forum on Sustainability. Apart from Zoom webinar, we are also live streaming in Putonghua for a Chinese audience. For friends on Zoom, please click the group icon and select your preferred language. I thank today's interpreters, Alini uh, Lorena Tolosa and Anna Nostrom for interpreting Portuguese and English. Pei Hai Tong and Dong Han Yu for interpreting English and Putonghua. My name is Sichui Jadi Margaret. I am Associate Professor at the Institute for Rural Revitalization Strategy at Southwest University, China. I'm also a founding member of the Global University for Sustainability. I have been actively involved in the rural reconstruction movement in China since 2000 year. Working together with Professor Lao Qin Chi, I am coordinating the programs of the South South Forums. We start the first South South Forum on sustainability in 2011. We are mainly concerned about alternatives to financial and ecological crisis and also experience of community regeneration in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. For this 10th South South Forum on Sustainability, the central theme is Thinking New Horizons. We aim to go beyond habitual frames of thought and action in order to foster new approaches and form a strong alliance of hope of the South. Today, we have the fifth webinar on heritage and ecological architecture. May I introduce the moderator, Dr. Uh, um, uh, yeah, um, Bing Hui Zhong is an associate professor at the Department of Archi Architecture in the Shanghai Academy of Fine Arts, Shanghai University. She has been a visiting scholar at Harvard University of Department of History of Arts and Architecture from 2019 to 2020. Now she is an associate of Chem Lab, uh, Harvard University. She is also currently uh, serving as the secret, uh, secretary, secretary general of the Social Committee of Religious Culture and Tourism of National Architecture Institute of China. The academic members of the Arch Architectural History Branch of Architectural Society of China. She is an accomplished uh, scholar of arts and architectural uh, history. Her expertise includes traditional timber frame construction techniques, the building practices of uh, master carpenters, uh, regional culture and architectural uh, history in China, regeneration and protection design of architectural heritage. Um, now I pass the floor to Hui Zhong. Thank you very much. Hi, so nice to meet everyone tonight. And tonight we will have three speakers. And the first speakers, let me introduce to everybody, is Christina. Dr. Christina Angel D. Elrevide is a professor at the Department of Architecture at the Federal University of Espirito Santo Rufus. She is also a visiting professor at the University del Biobel, Chile, the University del Oviedo, Spain, and the University of Minho, Portugal. She is a specialist in construction in in, in, in hospitable areas with activities in Antarctic and the Oceanic Islands. She was vice coordinator of the Urbanary Network, Energy Efficient Urban Communities, and coordinator of the Cyrus Network, Inclusive, Resilient, eco efficient and sustainable cities. She was Secretary of State for Science, Technology, Innovation, and Professional Education, and the President of the Aspirito Centro Research and Innovation Sport Foundation, and is currently 
Executive Secretary of the KP Expert Forum on Climate Change. And welcome and hope to listen to your uh, speech. Thank you. All right, then. Well, I'm going to speak about, uh, firstly, the context of urban sustainability, uh, bring forward some thoughts, some questions about what cities do we wish to have, other thoughts, speak about urban uh, climate changes, sustainable cities, these networks that I participate in, and some final thoughts. Just so you can understand where I'm speaking from, I'm speaking to you from Brazil, from the southeastern region, and within that region, the state of Espírito Santo from the city of Vitória, which is the state capital. When we speak about history of sustain, urban sustainability, it is very important to start off by saying that this begins with the Rome Club, which was first founded in 1968. And they had a concern which brought together researchers, artists, philosophers with a, a very important concern regarding the environment and sustainable development. Rome Club uh, publishes a book in 1972, which starts mentioning issues that became very important, which is energy. Now, in this book, the main thing is that they transform some discourses which were prevalent at the time into mathematical models. And therefore, they show that the planet cannot support this populational growth. I start off also by uh, apologizing for the fact that I wasn't able to translate my slides to English, but I'm speaking quite slowly and I believe you can understand me. So. Uh, but uh, still on history, there are issues regarding the Kyoto Protocol, which were very important to develop the very concept of sustainability and several ensuing conferences up to the point in which we uh, reached a global consensus. The main issue is that the protocol, which was finished in 1997, uh, uh, had as wanted to um, diminish, to decrease the emissions of hothouse gases. Uh, now this begat a report called Our Common Future. This brings us a concept for sustainability, which be started to be uh, forwarded by many countries, repeated over and again which is the development which, which answers to current needs without compromising the capacity of future generations to answer to their own needs. The idea of world peace was also prevalent. And how would that be related to the resources we have at hand in our planet? But that wasn't enough. This concept is was no longer enough. and and now it's not enough either. And in Latin America, we consider that the conference of 1992, the UN conference called ECHO 92, the World Forum, it brought a very important issue by saying that we can no longer speak about the environmental issues without associating it to economic issues and mainly to social issues. After ECHO 92, there were several agendas. Firstly, the 21 agenda, Agenda 21 for Sustainable Construction in Developing Countries. They felt they showed us the need of moving from discourse into goals for buildings and cities. And from that point on, we, we realized that we needed to change. After that, there was the UN Conference on Climate Change, which questioned which way forward, how would we move forward towards sustainability? 
Now this graph, this image is very well known, but I always like to show it because it shows us how technology based and the development of technology uh, impacted um, population growth in terms of quantity. The population growth that was viable through technology. Climate change is a menace to this evolution of world population, to its growth. We really believe in that. If we look at history, in, 19, in the 1900s, 10% of cities of people lived in cities and 90% lived in rural environments. In 2007, it became half and half. In 2030, we believe that 60% of the world population will be living in cities. And in 2050, an incredible 75% of the world population will live in cities. That that is our look our outlook on sustainability has to look has to be based on urban issues clearly when we look at worldwide urbanization i'm going to show you the evolution from 20, 1950 to our uh, idea for uh, what will happen in 2030 i would like you to pay attention to the circles the colors yellow red and orange, uh, where is, which are where we find the highest degrees of growth and evolution. From that to 1970, to 2000, 2010, 2020, and finally our uh, provision for 2030. Look at what happened to medium-sized large cities and mega cities. There was an increase of 2.6 uh, times uh, for medium cities, cities, four times for large cities, and almost 10 size, ten times increase for large mega cities. So we have to design our cities. What are the cities we want to have? What are the concepts we wish to apply? Will we go back to the idea of these rural cities, or shall we move towards into super technology? We can see in the image, the human scale is dissolved in this city, or should we imagine and dream with what we, what is called green cities? There, there are several labels that we can place on cities. Ecological, which is a city geared towards uh, environmental, smart cities, which are more geared towards technology. There's also the idea of greenwashing, which is in fact a veneer of sustainability, which is geared towards marketing, which for us is the worst case scenario. And the idea of sustainability, a sustainable city, which seems to us the more a uh, fitting model which brings together environmental, economic, social, and cultural issues. Now, this is what I want to focus on these issues. My city, my home city, my beautiful city, Vitoria, which is my adopted hometown. In Brazil, we have, we also find this type of uh, cities, and we have mega cities like Sao Paulo. And if we So our cities, they have more differences. For example, from Hong Kong, maybe we, we have more differences than similarities among these cities. And when we're talking about sustainability, how can we talk about sustainability for these two types of dads, fathers? We are approaching to a difference between what is the human race. We are different. I think that this is very important when we talk about anything related to sustainability. So we, if we're going to evaluate the cities from the most urbanized countries that are more related to the rural zones, we have noted that the per capita income when most of the population lives in the cities is four times higher than when compared with the, with the countries that have more rural areas. 
So what is sustainable for the local reality? And how should we consider the these problems, these potential potentialities and the culture in every place. How can we access the location without losing sight of the global interrelationships, whether in environmental, economic, or political issues involved? A single solution cannot be adopted for so different realities. In Brazil, I'm not sure how it is in Hong Kong and in other countries, but we talk a lot about we refer this phrase think to think of outside the box to think different from what we always thought and there's so many people that live inside this box and is not even aware that is living inside this box and have a difficulty in thinking outside of that box so again here's my beautiful city Vitoria that I'm showing here in another photo and we when we when we see above, it's a beautiful city that seeks for sustainability. But how can we talk about sustainability when we always we also have these types of landscapes in this other image? So some reflections here. I think it's we should discuss these new times that are here, and even faster and faster. Shouldn't we have an urban revolution in these new times? This process of transformation that began in the history that I, I mentioned of technology, the cultural revolution, economic issues, the climate changes, these new forms of social relations and the pandemic. So many things have happened. And what about the public? Have these public policies do they keep up with the new times? Uh, what is it worth that we continue producing a, a, academic knowledge if this doesn't reach the society? We still think about spaces, virgin spaces that were never rarely occupied. And where is the incentive for our students and professionals for a huge urban regeneration and not to continue building in the spaces that are not occupied. So what is the model of sustainability or the uh, intelligent model to be adopted in these new times? What do we really want with the urban development? I think everyone seeks for economic growth, security, feasible cities, and wants also the environmental balance and of course a social equity without social equity we will not have uh a, we will not have a society but a barbarian landscape brazil for example is the eighth country with the most inequality in the world we have more and more landscapes like this we have a, a more a far away society divided and in the, they're occupying more and more spaces in the urban societies. And climate changes that uh, for some time ago seems to be science fiction is more and more near to our reality. This is a, a real scene that al already happens nowadays. And that we hear with more and more frequency. And these other uh, climate effects are also very frequent and real today. What is happening also? The, the COVID gate brought us an alert of how we're going to, what is going to happen from now on. So we know that the GHD reductions are unlikely to come fast enough to avoid severe climate changes and how to avoid the severe climate change impacts. We have a high probability that this global temperature increases will be 
considerably even higher than the, the goal of two degrees adopted in the Paris Agreement in 2015. So we have to go to, to a B plan. What is our model of the city? We have an uncontrolled growth of segregation. We have a deforestation to construct new buildings and also the expansion of the industry. We have more and more atmospheric pollution, unsustainable energy sources, and the uh, non-degradable wastes and the vegetation that is all only left in the residual space and also the compromised urban mobility. So there's something wrong in this landscape. So we have to transform these unsustainable cities to become a little more sustainable. And this is a struggle between the sustainable and the unsustainable societies that want to have at least half and half to be a little more sustainable. But we, we should seek for will be the results that we imagine as sustainable and that take over the first spotlight spotlight in the in this sustainable city so what is this sustainable model this sustainable model we we seek for the urban rivers and to uh, profit from these models of high high level sediment models and of course we we seek for renewable energy sources and that's more and also that the vegetation is not restricted only to plant spaces and that the urban mobility is efficient and at the end what do we want with all of this that the people the population that live in the cities have quality of life during the 50s, we questioned everything. Sorry, in the 50s, we didn't question anything. In 70s, we questioned everything. In 90, we questioned the questions we had at the time. And in 2010, we thought that we have enough questions. And I ask you, and what will happen in 2030 in this landscape? What will we gonna seek for? What will be our goals? I'll just interrupt this, this, uh, this rationale to talk about CITAG, which is the Ibero-American Program of Science and Technology for Development. It was created in 1984, and it consists of all 21 Spanish-speaking countries speaking Portuguese. It's a very important instrument to foster the collaboration. And we, we cannot think of doing anything if we're not together and we're not collaborating. And also to promote technology transfer actions in the Ibero-American region. I'm the coordinator of this uh, Network, the Cyrus Network, the Inclusive, Resilient, Efficient, and Sustainable Cities. And also the Vice Coordinator is Professor Luis Braganza from Portugal. We have, a, we have as an object to seek for the practical application of studies and successful experiences and they can be transferred for other cities as well. And we do this through journey seminars and workshops together with the municipalities uh, because we think that through this transformation, the administration managers will, we will reach the societies. So our main challenge is to get these cities and that we want to that they become more sustainable so it they can be environmental correct 
economic, economically feasible and that respect the local culture. So the Cyrus Network, it's it has as a, a it wants to reach this local manager administrator of this local city, and through this knowledge, this is our last publication, sustainable urban development that was published last week, and through these publications and other actions, we try to make that these administrators have instruments to try to manage these cities in a more sustainable manner. So we can reach our goal to have a more sustainable, sustainable cities. This network is, is, uh, is present in six municipalities in Brazil, three municipalities in Portugal, and four municipalities in Spain, and one in Costa Rica, also another one in Ecuador, one in Chile, and another one in Argentina. We are 21 groups and 121 people working together. I think to conclude, I think I have been already speaking for a long time. I just want to talk that we believe that this B plan, if the plan A is not working, the plan B is to be sure that the cities of the 21st century will have to be sustainable and smart or they won't be cities at all. That's my message and my talk. Thanks a lot for your attention. And our second speaker today is um, um, from East China University of Science and Technology. Dr. Yan Aibin is an associate professor from the Landscape Architecture and Planning Department. And he was selected for the 2020 Shanghai Puzhang Scholars Program. His research interests cover architectural history, China's classical garden heritage protection. And he has published more than 50 academic articles in this field and also presided over two national research projects. He's also currently serving as the vice chairman of the Special Committee of Religious, Culture, and Tourism of National Architecture Institute of China the academic member of the Architectural History Branch of Architectural Society of China, etc. Today, Mr. Yan will present us with a speech named Acupuncture and Meridians, the renewal of old districts of cities and the time-honored brands that exactly echoing our theme of the 10 Salsas Forum. Thank you very much. Thank you for your warm introduction and thank you for inviting me to this session. Christina provided us with a broad theme previously. And for me, maybe I will introduce you with a small project that is conducted in Shanghai Huangpu district that is about the central cities reconstruction. Maybe you are very familiar with the acupuncture and the meridian treatments in traditional Chinese medicine. And that is the reason why I put these two concepts into the rebuilding of our, our city. And in this whole process, we wish to make the historical buildings and time-honored branded that are the old commercial brands. We hope they too can be combined with each other for a better upgrading. The reason why I do this research and a project is that maybe you have known that China have experienced the three decades of rapid urbanization. In these three decades, every city of China has undergone a rapid expansion of the city. And there are more and more buildings in the cities. So our real estate industry is quite saturated. So in this condition, our city planning has many obstacles. Maybe with such a rapid development or expansion process or the real estate industry oriented development plan, our city will face more challenges. So we are in the crossroad of uh, upgrading. In 2016, 
the Shanghai Municipal General Plan from 2016 to 2040, we were the first to put forward the negative growth of the total planned land area for construction purposes in cities, which manifested that we have changed our um, city expansion era to another era of storage with more features of our cities. So this is the shift of today's urbanization. So we are now focusing more on the upgrading of the existing area of our city. So in this whole process, we have a very precious work that is how to revitalize our city cultural heritage. Actually, previously, most of China's cities were focusing on the protection of this cultural heritage. But in the recent 10 years, we have reset our mindset. Rather than the revitalization, we focus more on the reusage of the city cultural heritage. The reusage and the revitalization are the same important things. How should we revitalize those old sites and the buildings is very important in our city planning work. It is proposed by our central government, that is our cultural um, heritage of our cities should be revitalized and that their role should be combined with the development of our cities and people's daily life. That is also the reason why in recent city planning, we see more and more cities are focusing more on the combination of history and the present world. That is our focus of today's work. And we are facing challenges more than those material and tangible cultural heritage. We also have many intangible heritage. That is the time-honored brand. We all know that when we go into some old districts of a city, it is very concentrated with many time-honored brands. These time-honored brands have grown all this way in this old districts of the city. So we can see the targeted customers of the time on the brands are some elderly Chinese people or the area concentrated with local people. So we can see the old district and the time on the brands are coexisting with each other. So they too can be considered at the same time. It is more about the passing of history. It is more about the future position of the city. It is more about economic production. It is more about the reuse and production of the space and area. So I think it is about our modern city planning. So for Shanghai, we have over 180 China's time-honored brands recognized by the Ministry of Commerce, accounting for 18% of the total time-honored brands of China. And we also have 42 Time honored brands with Shanghai recognition. And the most of them are retail and the food services industries. The catering industry accounted for over one fifth of all of them. From 1949 to 2017, the famous China's time honored brands have reduced by over 90%. That is to say, over 90% of these famous time honored brands have disappeared. We only have the 10% left for us. So for the left 10%, about 1,600 time honored brands, over 20% of them have experiencing a long time losses for most of the time. And some of them are even phased out by the market. And only 10% of them can embark on the new road of innovation. Most of the time honored brands have witnessed so many obstacles in competition in the market. That is to say, in the renewal of old city districts, we also face another problem, problem that is the disappearance of the time-honored brands grown in these districts. So in our practices, my case study to be shared today is a combination with oath old city districts and time-honored brands located in Yandang Road in Huangpu District, Shanghai. Huangpu District 
is a very central part of Shanghai. It is in the western part to the Huangpu River of Shanghai. Actually, in this area, we have four parts, the Xintiandi area, the central part, and other two parts. So our case study is located right in this area. Let's put it more in detail. This area is our project. It is to the west of the north-south um, bypass of Shanghai. And here, the Huaihai Middle Road is a famous business street in Shanghai. The Xintiandi area is more vibrant. And here is also a business district. So this project is actually in the middle part of Huanghai, Huaihai middle area with less vibration of businesses. So we are trying to push forward a one access to circles planning strategy to make it a new business district. And here is our project, the Yandang Road. Actually, this area is not that optimized. So in the West, it has TX Huaihai region where it is very attractive to the youngsters. And in other areas, it is not that popular. However, this district is very attractive because it has many old regions. And along this road, it has many important business centers, including the Huaihai. However, in this part of the region, it is not that popular as we expected. So here is a picture about the vitality of the customers. And the, at the ends of the line, they are very vital. However, in the middle part, it is not that popular. And this area is where we need to make some plans. At the same time, there are many time-honored brands, including Changchun Shipping, Lao Da Chang, Harbin Shipping, Gongming Tun Da Jiu Jia, Quanguo, the National Tu Te Shan, a food store, and the Shanghai Women Goods Store. At the same time, here are many historic buildings with important historic meanings. After all this research, we have a strategy. First is that we use the urban acupuncture strategy. Like we are the medicine, we are the medicines that we cure the diseases targetedly and accurately. At the same time, we look at the whole city to care about the space and make a strategy for the whole city. And that is the meridians. First, the acupuncture. The acupuncture is about the time-honored brands. For these time-honored brands, the products and the technologies is lagging behind. So we need to do some research and development to make it more young and fashionable, to make it more sustainable in this new era. At the same time, we need to bear in mind it is a product. We need to care about its packaging and the selling. We can use the packaging strategy and the e-commerce to attract the young customers. At the same time, we're planning this time-honored products. We need to care about the space and the environment to make the people more immersive, immersive in the buying experience. And our research is mainly about three food stores, Changchun Food Store, Harbin Food Store, and Lao Da Chang. Lao Da Chang is about French bakery, the Shanghai uh, Harbin Food Store is about the Russian food, while the Changchun Food Store is about the food retailing store, store. And we will do some research in all the procedures. At the same time, we experience, we we use some experience from Japan. After Japan went into a stable economic development, it doesn't 
it didn't experience a very stable food catering industry development, and it has gone through a bubble economic disruption, and it has experienced the branches of the food industry. After all these decades of development, it has experienced the industrial upgrading. And it needs to take into consideration the environmental and the health problems. Now we look at Japan. If you go to a restaurant in Japan, you will not see garbage in the store. So it improved both the catering industry and the environmental protection. And it has provided the customers a very good eating experience and environment. And these are insights that we can take from Japan, especially in our time-honored food product. For example, we can improve the product research and development and the ultimate cra uh, craft shift. For example, we can uh, make some probiotic drink and meat drinking seasons. We can do some uh, changing from the traditional powder into lava nochi. We not only sell the products, at the same time, we can sell some uh, packages of products and we can sell more healthy products with low calories. At the same time, we also made some strategies in the uh, packaging and the selling and the space and the environment. So after the acupuncture, we used um, the time-honored brands and make it vital. The cities have so many vitalities with so many uh, vital points, but how can we make the whole city vital with all those points? So this is the meridians we're talking about. And it can be divided into three directions. First, the customers. How can we make the streets more vital and can make the customers transform from one district to another district smoothly? Another thing is the resources, including the transportation, the information, and the uh, materials. Another thing is the trend. We should combine the traditional Chinese style and the fashionable and young living style. So the meridians cares about the customers, no matter in the weekdays or the weekends, after looking at all those customer flows, it all goes through the Huaihai Road and the Xintiandi district. However, when it goes to a certain part, the customers become uh, less and less. So the Huaihai Road is very popular. However, the branches road uh, surrounding it is not that popular. So how can we trans? Uh, meet all these customers into other branches of the road. That is the problem we need to think about. So we make an analysis of the customers' movements. The red line represents the original flow of the people. And the orange lines are the original uh, streets, which also are somewhat popular, but these streets and these customers cannot hold up the whole district. So how can we make the clients from these streets to go into the branches and other districts and come into the communities? We hope that it like the veins in our body to transform all the Clients into the body, all corners of the body. And here is the sharing channel protein, which communicates the people, the resources, and the trends, which can collect all the different resources here. How can we make the customer, the resources, and the business 
more open instead of a closed area. To make the more balanced contributors in the district. So that's the purpose of our design. For example, in Huaihai Road, the first picture is the current is the old situation. The main street is very crowded. However, the side areas is not like that. So what we want is in the second picture, which is that we want the crowds to go into the branches, then go to the next district. In such circumstances, the people can go to the surrounding regions. For one thing, it can reduce the transportation pressure of the Huaihai Road because every street have uh, accommodation capacity. Another thing is that it can make the other areas around the main street more popular and vital. So this is our strategy to make the Huaihai Road a center, but at the same time, we use our protein channel to connect all the people and other business reason, regions. And we need to take into consideration the business, the fashion and the culture and the creativity and the city space. However, in the old city space, we do not have enough space, not only for human, but also for the goods. The goods can only be transported in the nighttime. So what we can do is to develop the underground space. We can develop a large parking lot underground and connect all the parking lots. To connect all the mega shop shopping malls and the underground parking lots. So it tells a compact traditional Shanghai story. Well, underground, we make a complete and smooth transportation network. So here's our systematic research of all the buildings around. I won't talk a lot about it. For example, here is the Shanghai Women Goods Store. Here are the pictures at the day and at the night. In the night, it is very beautiful and brilliant but all the windows are only display windows. You can only walk in from the two doors at the two ends of the store. There are only two doors where people can go through and other are only display windows. So this means that people are all crowded at the two stores. So what can we do? We want to make people convenient to go into the store from all directions. And at the same time, we make the simple display window into an immersive experience window where you can have the special interaction with the display and a walk-in experience. Another building is the Yongye building. It sells the snacks from uh, the, from all parts of the country. And here is also a picture from the day and the night. You can see from the picture, it is kind of messy along the road. And at night, it doesn't have an attraction point where it can attract people in. So our design is to make there, make there more doors to let people in and make many display windows that can attract people. So this is the picture after our design. At the same time, we want to improve the business model. In the recent three decades, the cities have experienced huge changes. It used to be one street and cities along the street. But later we develop 
an open street, then we design the box consumption, which means there is a comprehensive shopping mall. So we can have many small stores in the big shopping mall. But the problem today is we are focusing more on the health and the experience. So the box consumption cannot satisfy the needs of the people. So now we want a multi-space consumption model. We want to have uh, the open street, the along the street consumption, at the same time a box street, which is a mega shopping mall. We want to have them all. So by making this design, we have a more open city space. So the original design, we only have the open space along the road. But now we want to combine the open space, the semi-open space and the private space. And there are many high buildings in the space. If you stand on the high buildings, you can see the gardens and the buildings from the top of the buildings. So how can we make a scenery out of this? So we make a 3D dimensional design where you can stand on the top of the building, then you can see many roof gardens which extend to the Huaihai Road. These city gardens is not only for a creation. At the same time, it is a very important public space because it, an important problem is that with the real estate pricing goes high, the young people cannot afford the high price and the consumption. So we built, so in this area, we provide them space to do the art, to do business, where they can afford to settle in. On the one hand, they cannot, uh, they can escape the crowded transportation. Because people go into the city center and go out of the city center all at the same time. The city transportation is faced with great pressure and high pollution. We hope that in our spot, more people can just live in the city center. So how can we do that? We gave them a small living space where they can live without doing anything else. But what about their needs of the study room, the kitchen, our solution is to provide them with a public kitchen, public study room. So this can effectively reduce their living costs. For example, the Peiwen apartment. This used to be an apartment. And the first layer of the apartment is store and some people rent them to use them as the workshop, as the offices. People used the first floor to do all kinds of things. So it is very messy and there is no centralized governing and management and service. So what we want to do is to encourage people to use the inner space as and as offices. But at the same time, we design a common kitchen, the common study room to resolve the needs of people living in the apartment so they can live more comfortably in the building. And at this space, we build some new buildings. These are the buildings where the people can share for common use. 
and we have built many corridors where they can conveniently go into the common area from their homes and their corridors, and they can cook and they can work there. So with this transformation, we can build this apartment as a place of concentration of arts, culture, and fashion. Actually, in Shanghai, the fashion industry is quite booming. If we can only provide customers with traditional costumes, then it cannot keep up with the trend. So we should rely more on our fashion and culture and build this whole area into a pool of arts. Therefore, this area can be a landscape of arts, and it can also be a pool to attract fashion and art talents. So here's the transformation process of Paywood apartment. We wish to build this whole building and complex connected, and it can extend to the north and south area. And therefore, the corridor will be broadened and the human traffic will be even higher than before. So here's the basic modes of the transformation of pavement apartments and also the planning of space in this area. Additionally, as for we walk, it is also a new concept. Old everything, new design in the central part of this building are designed to provide more we work space. With the help of the corridor, the space corridor, we can build more connections to channel the human traffic. So in this WeWork area, they will not pay for the high rent of offices buildings. They, all they have to pay is a very low price. Additionally, we want to build the roof of this building into a space garden house. Apart from, mm, apart from tourism, it can also attract the people to come here and make it a dining room, make it a gym, or making make it a space to hold space club or a mini museum. All of them can be realized in this area. And in the southern part, there is a Yandang building. We wish to build it a T runway with complex three-dimensional functional transportation because the surrounding Xinjiangdi area is quite intensive. So we wish to build this area into an industry of fashion and clothes. If it can be effectively connected with Xinjiangdi, then it will be a functional complex altogether. But between these two areas, there is a bypass. It is a natural obstacle that separates the two areas. So our solution is to build a space pedestrian pi bus under this higher pi bus. With this help, we can better channel the, hum the, the people traffic. And we can also build this bypass into a T runway of fashion and the many shows can be held here. It is quite splendid and fantastic. So in this way, we wish to use the methods of acupuncture to revitalize the time on the brands. And with the help of the channel protein, we can also help to channel the flow of people, the logistics and the flow of resources from Yandang Road to Huaihai Middle Road and build the Huaihai Middle Road into a complex with residential buildings we work we home and ultimately build this whole area into a demonstration area of we city that can be shared by all citizens in this area. That is my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Yan, for your pre presentation. Our previous speaker, Christina, offered us a uh, concept and your presentation is closely connected with her concept that is the sustainable city mode. And Professor Yan's presentation 
is the rebuilding of Huai Hai Middle Road in Shanghai. It is a very specific case study and it has provided us with an efficient mode of sustainable development of city planning. Let's say time for our final and the third speaker, Eka. Let me introduce him first. Eka Swedenster is the principal architect of Office of Strategic Architecture founding member of Global University for Sustainability. Member to the East Government Heritage Heritage Board of Harvard. His practice and research focused focus on the decolonialization of thought-based architecture and urbanism. His sixth and the last book entitled Gender Tiger Gamer the history of spice root back to Uganda Island, one of the origin of global colonialism, where he then utilized unique tools to propose alternate post-colonial narrative. Then, please. Everyone join me in welcoming Professor Eka. Good evening uh, for every one of you, uh, colleagues from uh, Asia. Good day to those of you residing in uh, Africa and Europe. Uh, good morning for those of you in, uh, in the Americas. Okay, first of all, I would like to uh, thanks to the Global University Network for the invitation. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, also, thank you for uh, Professor Huzang Bin for the uh, very warm, uh, kind introduction. Okay, for, uh, let me share my uh, PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, so uh, today uh, I would like to focus on the uh, definition of the cultural heritage first. Okay, so how we can uh, actually define uh, what is cultural heritage, uh, specifically in Indonesia, only by two words, and it's actually very hard to, to define that. Uh, and I will try uh, to start with a very short introduction uh, of the prehistoric to uh, early history origin and assimilation in, in Indonesia. Uh, the theoretically, uh, this is the, the most common uh, theory used, uh, the, the out of Africa migration hypothesis. Uh, which is uh, basically according to the hypothesis, meaning that the modern uh, human, prehistoric human, would receive, uh, would would uh, would came to a part of Indonesia plus minus sixty thousand years ago, which is it's actually not really correct because uh, 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 actually uh, archaeologically the oldest prehistoric human found in Indonesia uh, is belongs to the uh, Homo erectus archaic Sangiran dated back, back to uh, 1.8 to 0 0.7 million years ago. So it's, it's not accurate, but uh, nonetheless, that's how, how uh, globally it's believed uh, 60,000 years ago. Anyway, so, so we're going back to, uh, going forward to the early uh, history. So we're talking about uh, during the PC, so starting from the one PC. Uh, we would have uh, also the greater Nusantara territorial hypothesis, which, which we in Indonesia called it the Nusantara uh, uh, territory, uh, consisting of uh, Southeast Asia, Micronesia, Melanesia, and Polynesia. And then if we zoom it in, uh, we would have two different uh, kind of entry point, if you may, the Austronesian route and also the uh, uh, Austroasiatic route. So uh, where, uh, if we go, directly to the architectural uh, archaeological uh, examples, the question would be uh, uh, what are we talking about here? So we, we have the prehistoric stone culture, for example, this one, uh, megalithic uh, in, in Poso. Uh, and then also the, the large, this was a small scale. And then the large scale, we will have the Gunung Padang in, in Jawa Barat. Uh, but also uh, from, the, from the stone uh, culture, there's also, ne uh, next there's also the introduction of uh, wooden culture assimilation, which is uh, closely related in location with the stone uh, uh, prehistoric uh, uh, findings. So we have, for example, uh, in this one in Nias, 
and then uh, the other one is in, in Toraja in, in uh, Sulawesi. So from there, uh, if we go forward, uh, we, uh, we, we can then start to dig in a little bit deeper on the architectural context. So uh, we'll start with the wisdom from the ecological conscious, uh, Austronesian Nus uh, Nusantara house architecture, so it's specifically house architecture, which uh, circa uh, first to fifth century. So uh, this one, uh, one of the theory that's usually uh, commonly used is the 70 ethnic groups according to the living house by uh, Professor uh, Roxana Waterson. So from these 70s, uh, 70 ethnic groups, we can uh, uh, make a, a little bit of kind of a, a conclusion where we can start with the very early uh, wooden cut split knot method, which is uh, an unprocessed wooden uh, method of construction, which dated back to the megalithic age. And then next we have the basic uh, wooden processing uh, based in uh, bronze, bronze age. And then uh, also the intermediate wooden processing uh, during the Iron Age. That's where we start to find joints and, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, among these from the first to the fifth century, we have some common features. So uh, most of the early uh, materials here are took from this book, uh, the uh, Indonesian Heritage Volume Architecture, which uh, uh, co-edited by uh, Professor Gunawan Cahyono. So uh, the first common features is that the ecologically conscious uh, raised pile uh, foundation. Now, by, by the means that we call foundation, it doesn't really mean only the foundation, but all the way to the structural system from, from the foundation to the columns, to the beams, and how they would uh, move together if, if the uh, uh, earthquake should happen. And it's a common thing in Indonesia. And then the next common feature, uh, the obvious one would be the extended roof ridge. It, it would extend very long and it's usually accommodating the, the problem with the rainfall, uh, heavy rainfall that we have here in Indonesia. Now, uh, from there, we go to the inspiration from the advanced geometry that was introduced uh, the classical Nusantara temple architecture. So from housing to the, uh, to the temple, the, uh, about to the guts, to, uh, if you may. So this this uh, dated circa uh, sixth to fifteenth century, where if we go make the transition first uh, back to the house, so we have the advanced wooden joinery and the basic masonry uh, during this classical Hindu Buddhist age. Uh, some of the examples are in in Bali and East Java, and then uh, from there, then we have the temples, uh, the Hindu and Buddhist temples. Some of the big ones are, uh, for example, Muaro Jambi in, uh, dated from the uh, Sriwijaya kingdom in Sumatra, 7th to 14th century, the kingdom. Uh, and then the, the, the famous Borobudur and Prambanan temples of Medan kingdom. This is uh, central Java in, in Yogyakarta, uh, 8th to 11th century. And then uh, on the east of Java, we have a troll land, urban gates, monuments and temples of Majapahit kingdom, which are smaller, but they actually put uh, 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 in together in the form of urban territory. So it's like uh, one of the first uh, urban centers in Indonesia that have been uh, unfilled. So, but then uh, the, the difference that we have nowadays than to the, say, the, the modern days, during those years uh, that we have actually in the Southeast Asia region, a multipolar civilization. So it's not a single polar, it's, it's, it's not a dual polar, it's, it's a multipolar civilization. Uh, now we can see that from the architectural works, uh, the Southeast Asian Hindu Buddhist temple constellation that consisted of six, uh, at least six uh, big country, uh, big uh, kingdoms, Sriwijaya, Madang, Khmer, and Angkor, Bagan, uh, Majapahit, and, uh, Amra, uh, and Arakan Brau which uh, dated from 7th to the 18th centuries uh, and uh, occupied almost the whole Southeast Asia. So uh, during those time in Indonesia, it also goes hand to hand with the uh, development of functional advanced uh, wooden architecture. Uh, we can see similarities in, for instance, Taiwan uh, and Japan. Uh, and this in Indonesia, it's, uh, uh, most of them can be found in the Balinese high-rise structure for uh, outdoor religious activities. So these are the examples. Uh, let me start with the gates. The stone, uh, uh, the Bali Hindu temple in form of stone gates. So we have the difference. So this is how we go from 
left to right down to to uh, right to left. So chronologically, okay. So we have the uh, the different gates, which if we put them together, they actually uh, uh, created or developed during almost the same time with the the late classical age of the temples. So we have the uh, temples in in Java, the, the late one, and then the early uh, uh, gates in Bali. Now, uh, during those those years, also the development of the Balinese temple in the means of uh, uh, wooden buildings, which also has the similar characteristics that goes uh, high uh, up with uh, mostly with Meru, uh, one single post, uh, central post. But also we can see chronologically how it goes from, uh, from first setting up the first uh, 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 construction system, and then how it then becomes a higher and then it becomes suddenly uh, smaller and smaller or, or thinner, if you may, but and then also thinner and high. The, the thing is that there's also the difference, the chains of rites that happen, the ritus that change also, and then the, the, uh, the more uh, attempted uh, uh, different of practice that goes, uh, tend, tend to go outdoor. So, uh, and then from there, enter the evolution towards a highly functional Islamic Nusantara mosque architecture, which dated circa 15th to 18th century. Uh, and then uh, the development is also doing uh, at hand to hand with the same, at the same time uh, with the development of the uh, wooden architecture, um, uh, Japanese long span structure. So before we have the, the, the high uh, building, now we have the long span structure. That's also shift again the rights from outdoor to indoor religious activities. So in this uh, Japanese uh, example, we can, uh, it, it's uh, mostly done by the uh, Japanese Wali Songo, which is the Islamic saints, uh, and then Wali Nubah, which is the Islamic saints disciples, and then the Mataram kings uh, for mosques and langar. Langar is basically the, the small one. So mosque is the, the big one, and langar is the small one. And there are basically, there are two distinctive uh, features in there that characterize this uh, architecture. We have the tier roofs, and then the soccer guru, which is a, a structural pose and columns. Again, this correlates to what we have been talking before in during the Austronesian uh, uh, architecture, uh, cultural heritage. And then if we differentiate that into two different types, we'll have the great mosque, the big ones, usually has three tiers roof, four soccer guru, so the four main posts in the middle, and then 12 soccer empire or more, so 12 uh, smaller post, but this is even if it's small, it's still big, right? Uh, uh, surrounding the the four central posts. Well, on the smaller one, we have the langar with two tiers roof mostly, and four soko guru without soko empire or with soko empire, but they are not really functional. Okay, so uh, here are some examples for that. We start with uh, the the famous one, the the earliest famous one. We have the dema, which is uh, Agung dema are dated to 1477, and then some Cipla Rasa, 1480. In this one is Central Java uh, on uh, West, uh, 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 yeah, Central Java to, and then this one to West Java, Masjid Banten, 1556. Gede Mataran in Yogyakarta, 1640, on the south of Java, and then this whole south, south in Java, in Kraton in, in Surakarta, 1768, and then Masjid Gede Kauman in Yogyakarta in 1773. So we can see how the, the, the uh, evolution of the architecture, and then it, it goes to the next level from the outdoor use to the indoor use. And then because of the, the religion that came requires different uh, spaces to use, and then it, becomes, uh, it then it becomes a long span architecture. But, and then the mosque also consisted of many, many smaller mosques, uh, which is called langar. So, uh, uh, for instance, this is a, uh, for instance, these are some of them. Masjid Agung Kasunyatan, this is in Banten, 1552, and then uh, Sunan Geseng Bagelan, and then Anke in Jakarta, 1687, 18, uh, uh, Godekan in uh, Eastern Java, 1840s, and then uh, in in Central Java, two of examples that I bring here uh, from Sunan Bayat and also Plaza Kuning uh, from uh, both dated in 18th century. So even that they have a, a smaller 
uh, size, but they they try to maintain the same characteristic of, of this uh, uh, system, uh, structural system. And then if we see uh, the development of the long span goes also hand to hand, uh, almost at the same time with the development of a uh, Mehru central roof, uh, uh, central structure, high, high building in Bali. So this one in Java, this one, this one in Bali. So from there on, we can make the second conclusion is that uh, when we're talking about this mosque, it's ecologically conscious already. So the most design, ecologically conscious most design in Java is actually distinctly different to the Middle East canons, even when the religion itself came from Middle East. So the, the religion came to Indonesia, but the architecture that came to Indonesia is not necessarily coming from, uh, from, from, coming from outside of Indonesia. So how so? How can we can we say it? Uh, how can we define it as an ecological conscious architecture? We can see how it's utilizing local material and construction methods, and then it uses an open plan and open air cross ventilation system. So you can see it's it's an open plan, uh, uh, functional architecture, but it's also all open air. So you can see how the hot air can be sucked in up and then goes out and. Uh, this kind of knowledge can only be uh, uh, can only be uh, innovated through the uh, uh, very slow moving uh, evolution. How this uh, kind of uh, even the Islamic architecture that presented in Indonesia is actually the next evolution of the Hindu Buddhist uh, uh, architecture. So that's that's there's a, a there's a continuation of evolution evolution of of uh, wooden architecture that happens in, during the years. From there came to the uh, colonial period. So which is, which is colonial, uh, of course, colonialism uh, get handled, uh, entangled in the whole global uh, worldwide system. But the thing is that uh, some, some of us cannot, uh, uh, some of us cannot really see it as a period. It means that uh, one colonial age is actually divided into different periods. Now, uh, some uh, the examples that I can put forward today in Indonesia, they are actually uh, for periods of colonial architecture development. Uh, and it was hand to hand using uh, 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 created during the creation of uh, modern civilization in Indonesia. So it happens uh, roughly for centuries, 16th to 20th centuries. Now, if we see here, we can see that uh, the, the four centuries actually uh, 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 give us a different kind of different types of architecture, different kind of uh, 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 characteristic. Uh, it begins with a purely Dutch architecture imported to, to Indonesia, uh, the, the Dutch East Indies, the colonial architecture. But and then the next century, uh, the Dutch also introduced the broader European language of architecture that came uh, a century before that. So this one is a 16th century that been implanted in Indonesia in, in 17th century. This one is the 17th century of Europe architecture implanted in the 18th century. However, the, 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 uh, the Dutch uh, architecture that brought in also assimilated to the pre-colonial vernacular architecture and create a distinct in this architecture. Uh, dated back in the 18th century. So uh, during those times, we can see that the, the, uh, the architecture that's been produced by the Dutch is actually becoming more and more localized, if you may say. But and then the 19th century, uh, specifically starting with the appointment of our uh, Governor General Daniels, which uh, actually only uh, came in Indonesia in a very short period, it became Governor General during uh, 1808 to 1811. He reintroduced Europe to Indonesia, uh, and uh, which is specifically called the, the French Empire style, and created this uh, so-called Indies Empire uh, architecture. Hence, the architecture that created during this uh, specific time, 19th century of colonial Indonesia, becoming uh, goes back to the European root. Uh, and then, but uh, the, and during the last period of uh, uh, the last uh, century of uh, colonialism in the 20th century uh, came in the Euro modern architecture at the same time. So this is the 20th century uh, uh, European modern architecture implemented in the 20th century Indonesia. So it came in the same time, not delayed one cent century anymore, which is highly uh, influenced by pre-colonial vernacular architecture and created the new Indian style architecture. 
this is the, the thing that we uh, we are not so often aware of or talk talk about. So just to give you an idea of the examples, I'll just uh, give a, a specific uh, government ar architecture, the, the Dutch government uh, architecture in Indonesia. We have, this is the first uh, colonial century. That's, uh, this is the Istana Mini in, in Banda, which is, it looks very European. And then this is in Batavia, early Batavia in the late uh, 18th century. So it became in the, in the yeah, it's in the, in the late 18th century. So you can see how it becoming more tropical, but and then on in 1827, early 19th century, the introduction of uh, Indus Empire makes the development of architecture that happens in in uh, in, in Indonesia be, uh, moving back towards the uh, uh, European route. But then then the next century, uh, we can see the new Indus style uh, took off. And it actually a uh, kind of creating a, a new type of architecture that's you cannot really see in in Europe, and neither it was uh, ever built in in Indonesia. So this is a completely new uh, a new breed of architecture. Now, if we go back to the uh, the book here, there are some some of the uh, quick examples for that. So you have the 18th century country house. You can see. A long reach, a uh, 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 extended reach of uh, uh, of uh, roofing, and then, but also the, the different kind of posts, not necessarily lifting lifter up a uh, 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 column a uh, uh, foundation, but the columns is surely lift up. But you can see it's this is uh, you got the idea of uh, of having a vernacular type of influence in the colonial uh, structural system. But then, then, of course, there are the new functions that's never been uh, in the vernacular terms of the, the large offices that need us, the banks and so on and so forth, the hotels, early hotels, which requires a totally new kind of uh, uh, architecture that's never been uh, uh, built in Indonesia. And then uh, from there, this is the, the last phase of colonialism that, that shows the introduction of new uh, emergence of new in this style. Now that's theoretically, but when we talk about it uh, or practically, there are actually so many uh, examples that we can we can use. The problem is that uh, because the theoretically is not really a, a, a formalized in a way that we understand the Dutch architecture is actually also influenced by the vernacular uh, Indonesian architecture. The problem is that we cannot really reread. We cannot. We, uh, sorry, we cannot read. What, what's actually in, on the fields. Now, using this, uh, with using this uh, mechanism or using these um, uh, methods that I've, I've put forward before, we can now reread what happened in the practice uh, and in the fields. For example, this one is the early, uh, back in the very early colonial period where the architecture uh, produced is supposed to be uh, totally European, if you may say. But if you can see here, some of the architecture that uh, that uh, were built during this time. For instance, this is specifically in Banda, where the first colonial happened in uh, colonialism happened in Indonesia. You can see that there are, uh, there's a, a small roof that going uh, up above that. That is actually taken from the uh, assimilation with indigenous influence, uh, in particular the smokehouse in Banda, where it used to process the the uh, spices that produced there. To, uh, and then it's uh, where they burn the spices and then they let the uh, hot air and the smoke to go up and they create an openings. That's why when you have this kind of roofing, then you can have a, a, a kind of a natural cooling system to make the, 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 uh, the buildings actually cooler. So even if, it's, if it looks like very European, but it's actually a very uh, uh, vernacularly rooted, if you may say. Now, the other example is the functional assimilation that happens in the late uh, colonial period. This is uh, some, uh, uh, for example, the roofing system that you cannot really see in, in, you cannot really find in Europe. So it's a different kind of system uh, in relevance to heavy rainfall. And then uh, functional synthesis, for instance, uh, outer circulation. So you have the circulation outside the buildings that is not common in Europe, but it's used actually in response to hot and humid weather. So instead of having a long reach of, uh, of a long reach of roof without any function, it 
then the Dutch created a circulation outside the building to create a function, while at the same time sheltering the building from the hot, humid air. And then the other, the other, uh, the other also Im uh, important, interesting things is the substructural synthesis. For instance, uh, the use of uh, local material in specifically took uh, thick uh, wooden beams for creating a long span arches. So, so when you there's a need to create a long span arches, they they just put in this uh, wooden thick, uh, wooden thick, uh, uh, very thick thick wood, just to uh, to uh, uh, substitute the the structural pose and beam uh, system. So and then obviously you cannot find this uh, in in the Netherlands. And then also the introduction of new uh, uh, more, uh, material, which is uh, the uh, which is the slim steel uh, beam for a long span. So these are the things that happens, and uh, usually not really uh, what you call it, uh, are not really discussed enough. So from there, uh, I would now go back to the condition of today, to the context of we have today. Uh, of obviously, what happened in the past, the cultural heritage that we've been talking about for in the past 20 minutes or so, it's, it's, uh, it's not, you may say in, in a way, it's not relevant to today's questions, especially the urban questions. Now, uh, but, so, but then, then again, we need to understand that if we say the dystopia that happened now requires an utopia, so some things that, that is out of the box, some things that is practicable, but fundamentally, philosophically, it has to go all the way to create a new horizon. But the new horizon that becoming the theme of the conference today is not necessarily some things that need to be popping up out of nowhere. We can create a new horizon that is actually uh, found by looking back to the cultural heritage that we have. Now, for instance, if we have, uh, I took this from the uh, 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 William Lim books, uh, the Asian ethical urbanism, uh, at least the specifically for the Asian uh, uh, Asian uh, case of case studies, the urbanism that we have now it's totally different to the kind of urbanism that we have in the say G seven G seven countries. We have a very uh, you know different, uh, a very highly density densitified uh, urban centers, but also we have the cultural uh, identity. But and then of course, uh, and then uh, which had been mentioned on the first speaker, uh, the, the problem of the income gap. So, so for instance, I give you an idea of the how how we reread the dystopia into an utopia. For instance, this is a case that happened. We call it the suburb in the sky. It's a cosmo park. It's a it's a, a bourgeoisie a typical a landed house that's been lifted up and built uh, above the mega mall in Jakarta. And how nice, it's called the suburb in the sky. It's a way, a way to densify uh, the, the Jakarta and uh, in a sense uh, for the high-end uh, market of the halves. However, we also have a kind of different kind of densification that is not so different from that practically. Forbidden geographies, same, and then it's also uh, hypertensification, same thing. So, uh, for instance, this one, Kampung Warnawarni. Uh, so it's a, a not so informal settlement, uh, Brantas Riverfront in in Malam. But the thing is that when we when we talk about the forbidden geographies that use for the halves for the bourgeois uh, 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 population, it has a positive ring to it, where we have. It, Mostly the same thing, you know, uh, the, the same idea, the same characters. You have like a, a negative ring to it, so that's the problem. So uh, the the thing is that uh, the next thing is that uh, we need to look back. How do we look back? How do we draw inspiration to deal with this kind of thing? Now, uh, it, 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 the thing is that we need to go from traditional high culture because most of the. Uh, 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 wonderful pictures, the wonderful cultural heritage that been displayed before. It was part of the vernacular. Uh, it, it was part of the high culture halves. So uh, meanings that probably those years, like few uh, many centuries ago, it was built by aristocrats or or yeah, those uh, the rich people. Now 
in order to to be able uh, for us to be able to to make a context out of the, to this uh, situation we need to also include the vernacular common heritage which is again not so much talk about uh, so for instance this one's the korowai house in the sky formless no form in there and then high density living because this is a common house isolated in peripheral geographies in this scale on the top of the trees but then, then we also have uh, the other examples from the trees goes down all the way to the top uh, uh, on the sea by just house on the sea very formless very high density living uh, isolated in peripheral geographies so the thing is that actually in the past we already experienced very high density kind of livings and then we also uh, experience a uh, life with a, with a very limited resources in the peripheral geographies and and back then there was no problem in dealing with that so that's these are the kind of things that uh, we need to to put to uh, to use to utilize to draw our inspiration from uh, uh, we've been uh, blessed we have the chance from uh, given by global university to record this uh, e lecture uh, on uh, four days full days e lecture recording in, in 2017 that's trying to do exactly that how do we reread the whole urban architecture in the context of today while we also try to facilitate the, the problem of income gap? Uh, and, and the way to do that, we need to uh, uh, de deconstruct the whole uh, 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 academic understanding theories and to create a, a new bridge, a new horizon. Now, for instance, uh, what we presented during the e-lecture uh, back in the 2017, it goes in a multi-scale, starting from the very basic uh, reimagining South-South megacities in a regional planning scale, and then to the urban planning and urban design scales that would create a specific uh, kind of a, a specific kind of a proposal for a different kind of city. So I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm very, uh, uh, I agree with the notes the notion that put forward, there is no single solution for that. And then, but also all the way to the next uh, smaller scale, to the infrastructural architecture scale, which might not look uh, nice, might, might rhyme with the, you know, uh, a negative, uh, a negativity to it, but that's the thing, you know, we, we need to put a different kind of, uh, different kind of uh, a scale of measurement to, to to, to be able to deal with these sustainable problems. And then from, from there, if we go back to the high culture, we also, of course, need to, to attribute the high culture. For instance, uh, now Indonesia is building a, a new capital city. And then suddenly the questions of uh, uh, Indonesian architecture identity becomes very important. For example, uh, we when we're rethinking heritage, high culture heritage, and we have this uh, presidential palace that is currently under construction in the new capital that is sculptural form. It means that you know, it's supposed to rhymes the concept of the Garuda uh, symbol of the country's uh, uh, symbol. So it's a sculptural form. It's a very Eurocentric facet. You can see this is sculptural form, but if, if you go to the uh, level of the human perspective, you can see the columns, very Greco-Roman kind of a greco roman of architecture and then no rice uh, no raised pile foundation no extended roof reach so it will definitely not uh, uh, connect not be connected with uh, with the ecological conscious uh, heritage that we have had in the past millennium or so but also there's the other the, ex the other examples uh, for instance this is the vice presidential palace the winning design for this thing uh, so this one is a functional form so you can see it's its functions. It's ethnicless because we need to to make to, to have this kind of architecture in a in, in a very rich ethical ethnical uh, location like Indonesia. It has the idea of the raised pile foundation with columns and uh, and structural system and extended roof reach. So it doesn't look vernacular, but it it absorbs those uh, characteristics that been, we've been talking about. So. To conclude this, uh, you can see that uh, the new uh, if I want to re rephrase what uh, I've been talking in the past oh, almost half an hour, is that uh, the title would become uh, Nusantara Architecture, the visual voyage across millennium old ecological conscious civilization. 
So basically, the, what we have in the cultural heritage is actually already uh, uh, sustainable. The thing is that uh, it's, and we also need modernism per se, you know, for the for uh, for the better or worse. But the the things to deal with it to go forward to create a new horizon. Sometimes we need to look back, and sometimes it's actually easier to do that rather than testing something something new. And then uh, and then uh, and then. Uh, and then we need to do this uh, seriously. So we, uh, uh, I'm, I'm imagining that uh, maybe we can uh, discuss this further in a different uh, forum, uh, maybe a more rigid uh, discussion, a wider discussion, south-south discussion forum, uh, serious, uh, maybe like an Indonesian serious. And then, uh, for instance, China, Indonesia, Brazil, we all share the same long heritage. Uh, a heritage that is the, the civilization as old as Europe. So maybe we can create a, a different kind of series so that uh, in-depth uh, cultural heritage series so that we can learn from, it, from each other. That's, that's the, the proposal for the long-term uh, 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 follow-ups. Uh, and then the, the last thing is that the, the short-term follow-ups, uh, again, I just want to, to uh, introduce that we, we we are working in this rethinking cultural heritage in in, in terms of urban aqua room. This is a, a, a hybrid uh, event, so you can uh, you can all also continue. Uh, you can also join participate uh, online, where uh, we will put forward six different kind of topics in in this uh, presentation. The interpretation of Japanese wooden architecture to, into today's context, rethinking of Indian waterfront megapolis. Rethinking Bornean design identity, uh, rereading the urban history of uh, Hindu Buddhist classic and also Islamic to colonial classic in, in Indonesia, and then the interpretation of waterfront city design. Uh, all actually in line with the theme of global university of finding, uh, trying to find a new horizon. Uh, this this to be done on the 31st of August. Uh, I will keep you updated if you're interested through the global university uh, uh, networks. Okay, I think that's all from me. Uh, terima kasih. Thank you, Shishi and uh, Obrigado. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eka, for providing us such an excellent presentation. Muito obrigado. You provided us with a history of Indonesia, architectural heritage, and how should we gain knowledge and again, solutions of architecture from our history, the use of material, the ecosystem conservation. And you also bring us a new link between the history and the modernized architectural history. So I think it is a very inspiring presentation and speech. This evening, we have our three excellent presenters and all their speeches are specialized and all their themes are very pertinent to today's webinar, Thinking New Horizons, which means you can provide your new horizons from your own perspectives to help solve the problems in the new era in terms of urban development, rural revitalization, the passing on of cultural heritage, and you as architects and you as the scholars and the researchers provide us with new solutions of sustainable development of urban cities, especially for ECHA. In your presentation, you also share with us our platform, the Global University, and you are calling for people to communicate with us via this channel. I think it is very excellent and it is encouraging. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Professor Yan. And thank you, Ika. Thank you for your excellent presentations and speeches. So next, we may come into a Q&A session. Maybe I think I can raise my first question. Also, my personal insights and my questions so maybe i will raise the first question and i wish our 
attendees and our three presenters can have more active communication and discussion. And by this way, we can make our attendees learn more from our Q&A session about the theme today. So first, as for the presentation given by Christina, I think we focus more on how should we view the development of cities in the new era, especially for the metropolitan cities. And you use the urban revolution method to disrupt the obstacles in urban development. And you also inspire us of the green ecological, the cultural passage, and other perspectives of urban development in the new era. And in the discussion, you mentioned many of your point of views, and most of them are very inspiring, and you also put forward an example of a box. Our mindset are just like a box. How should we rush out of the box and think outside of the box? In such an intensive city area, how should we go out of that box and find a new way to provide high quality life for all our citizens? And in this whole process, we also gain many policies of the government and we can also have more communication with the local people. I think it is a very practical method. Personally speaking, I have my own question for Christina. Can you provide us with a specific example to illustrate how can we realize such a sustainable development of green ecology and good ecosystem for our citizens? How can we find such a solution? Because for me, I have been living in Shanghai for many years, it is such a metropolitan city. And we know that in the development area of city capital has many say here and the capital can decide in many things. I think for the rebuilding of the space and buildings, it is constrained by the use of capital. I think for our citizens, healthy or unhealthy, wealthy or poor, I think they can have their equal rights to a good living here in cities, but it is very difficult for us to solve this problem. For the residential area in Shanghai, just as mentioned by Professor Yan, in Huaihai Middle Road and in Waitan, in those areas, beyond those fancy malls, those commercial streets with strong package. Apart from those areas, there are also many residential buildings with a lot of citizens. How can we have the equal rights to really enjoy their living area, even though they may be very poor? So I think, Christina, please provide us with a specific example to illustrate the mode of development especially for the technology transfer. And additionally, Professor Yan also connects the presentation made by Christina very well. And you put forward Shanghai as an example. Shanghai may be the most luxury city in China. And you mentioned the Huaihai Road, Xintiandi area, which are the most luxury areas in Shanghai and you those areas you provide us with the upgrading and renewal of old districts and time-honored brands of Shanghai to do the city renewal. So in your presentation, you focus more on Shanghai as a central city of China to tell us we can use the treatment from traditional Chinese medicine like acupuncture and meridians to do the renewal work of the city. This acupuncture is not find the spots indiscriminately. However, we use the way of meridians to find how should we solve the problem? What are the pain points? And you also mentioned many examples like Pei Wen apartments and you illustrate 
demoed very well to us by using these examples. And you also provide us many in detailed examples like the roof gardens, the we work and the we home most, like the showering kitchens, the showering dining rooms. All of these are very inspiring and valuable. And me myself also want to ask you a question and that is for your examples. Maybe most of them are carried out by you yourself, your students, your colleagues from universities. You have a long process of discussion and research. I wonder whether all of those solutions can be actually fully implemented. And I wonder whether all those solutions can be made into reality in the near future to make a white high road actually a shared public space that can serve everyone, serve every citizen in Shanghai. So that is my question for you. Maybe you can provide us with some answers. And finally, thank you very much, Eka, for your introduction of the history of Indonesia architecture. And also it brings us with a lot of knowledge in the Indonesia architecture. Me myself is a scholar of China's traditional historical architecture. So many points, put forward by you have echoed to my research. So in China, we also have similar architectures, similar history. So thank you very much for giving us a roadmap of this architectural history. And I wonder whether you can provide us many more further implementation and further solutions that can be used in modernized urban planning, in space, in function. And the further on, maybe we can have more communication or cooperation with you, Eka. And you have also mentioned the wooden building in Taiwan, China, in Japan. And maybe you are not that familiar with mainland China, but in mainland China, we have a lot of architectures that are, have shared many common features with the architectures in Asia, especially East Asia. So I think we can have more further on communication or the common features of architecture in Southeast Asia. Maybe we can have many inspirations shared by us among different countries. How should we regulate the city development and how can we learn from each other to share the common traditions and histories in further modernized city planning. So we sincerely welcome you to come to mainland China to visit the traditional historical architecture here, to have more communication with us and do more cooperation projects with us. And we can, based on the forum provided by Global University, we can put forward the ecological conservation projects on this front. Thank you very much for your presentation. So me as the moderator, maybe I can make the full use of my role to raise my questions to the three of you. And for the next part, the floor goes to our three presenters and I wish you can have some answers to my questions. And I also wish to listen to your communication and discussion. And I also look forward to listening to the communication between our attendees and our presenters to discuss more on this theme. Think of new horizons. I think we can have more good points. So. Now the floor goes to Christina, Professor Yen and Eka, respectively. Muito obrigada. Thank you. I will then try to talk about some things that you mentioned. I think that in a quick reflection, in a very and it's sometimes dangerous to do a very quick analysis, but I will try to talk a little bit about the solutions that are expected, but based on time, because 
we have and maybe inspired by this beautiful presentation by the ar architecture time and history when we talk about for seeking for solutions for a more sustainable city we are also talking about medium long and and short term solutions and the short term solutions they they reach the population because the population they they are suffering from specific issues so these are more emerging issues so in this sense i really like this the for the talk for about the urban acupuncture the methodology of the urban acupuncture we can learn also from from your experience through these punct, uh, this uh, prompt interventions that that alter dynamics in the city so this is a, a way of working that already generates results and that can be replicated in other situations in many other situations but it also generates uh, medium-term solutions when you generate some solutions in, for example, degraded areas that you create a better condition in this degraded area that, that, it, that it can have a less need of mobility. So the same uh, housing place is the same place where the person can work and also to have their leisure. So this is makes it decentralizes some activities which is very helpful in the case of many large cities it to decentralize and to not transform the cities when we talk about a solution in medium term i have an example so i would like to tell of the policy that i mentioned uh, I would also like to mention the issues about politics. I mentioned that we create knowledge in academia, but we do not translate it to society. In this sense, policies are key. And also to make sure that we prepare personnel to work with politics and public policies. That's not easy because the people from the university are bred to be uh, teachers or working the market, but we do not create professionals who develop policies or who work with politics. We have an example of a public policy which was applied, which gives yields uh, medium and short term results. And it's very interesting. For example, we have mapped out the areas which we call vulnerable areas. These are the areas in which occupation is subnormal. And internationally, they are more known as slums or shanty towns. So we, we have mapped out our slums and what policy did we decide to put in place? Well, we also know that many of these slums, not all, but many. This issue, violence, uh, is was treated, well, there is a policy which is specific for fighting violence in these slums, but it is no use if you do not bring other issues also into play. So our, our Department of Culture also acts with cultural activities. Our Department of Education also acts trying to further access to education. Our Department for Urban Development acts in slums to make sure that urban, the urban landscape is reimagined. Re so we must integrate all of these actions to make sure that we can change the so-called slums into neighborhoods, into places where people live with better quality of life. We can do that with policies. The, it's a way of uh, having results. And I would say that when you are considering long-term results, it is essential to change the way we teach. 
to perfect education from the very early stages of education up to postgraduate education to make sure that education is a way that these topics, these ways of thinking about the future are seen, are looked at through the lens of education. This gives us long-term results. I must make sure that the people who come out of the university act in how the city is thought. We must start that from the very beginning. Now, my dream as a teacher is that one day, and unfortunately, I don't think this will be in my generation, that one day I may no longer need to teach sustainability. And that day, sustainability will be built into such a degree into every day's life, architects, engineers, etc., that we don't have to teach it anymore. I think that this is what we think in the long term. And this is something that is needed. We must invest. It is key and it is urgent. We must consider investments, in, consider, consider short, medium, and long term. Uh, I don't know if I could explain, if I was able to explain what I consider are possible solutions, but I do think that's it. Uh, uh, considering my other co-speakers, the brilliant co-speakers who are here with me, I would say that urban culture is key to obtain results in what we are doing here today. And this historical glimpse that we that was given. And in Brazil, we also have the same kind of, uh, uh, of um, synergy between cultures that are blended, which is also translated in our architecture and when it translates the place itself and it brings in technology, it normally, well, I'm not sure, but I believe so, it does give you good results. I don't know if I was able to explain what I thought, but thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina, for your answers to this question. It's a discussion because in metropolitan cities, for the sustainable use of open spaces in such big cities, we should look forward some humanitarian way to develop those areas. That is an imperative goal for us to realize. And in Christina's answer, she also mentioned that the research work, the university teachers, the organizations are all pushing forward this practice, but we should also build a bridge to link the administrations of the governments, the policy makers together with our practitioners and local residents. Only when the two parties are connected each other, we can have a better channel of communication, then the administrators and the policymakers can realize what are needed for our local people, those vulnerable groups, and for the utilization of technologies, the design of architectures, it may be a much easier talk. The most difficult one is policies. Good evening, Professor Bin. I would like to congratulate the speakers. Congratulations. Good Good evening, Professor Jay Zitsui. And now uh, I'm speaking to you fr from Hong Kong after a long trip from Brazil to Hong Kong. And my question is for Professor Christina, and I would like to firstly congratulate her for her talk. I had read her uh, presentation before. As Professor Christina said during her presentation, Brazil is one of the countries in which we find the highest inequalities in the world. Now this makes urban issues and its inherent challenges more complex because you're working 
with two different contexts and realities, the context of the rich and the context of the poor, which coexist in the same space, space or very nearby. And also the example of the pandemics. At the time of the pandemics of 2019, the rich were able to go into social isolation. However, the poor, because of the architectural features of their homes, isolation was much harder, much more complicated. So the poorest off suffer in Brazilian megacities. And I can also say, Christina, in medium-sized Brazilian cities from very serious structural problems. For example, the problems of the lack of basic san sanitation, of the collection of waste, the absence of sanitation. However, despite all of these problems in Brazil, we have 85% of our populations living in cities. I don't know whether our Chinese colleagues can imagine what China would be if it's uh, 1 billion and 400,000 inhabitants living at an 85% rate in cities. It would be absolutely impossible. And so 85% of the Brazilian population living in that lives in city are particularly concentrated in our mega cities such as Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, Salvador, Fortaleza, and Belo, Belo Horizonte. So I would like Professor Cristina to speak a bit more about the relation between challenges of a, a future city, of a sustainable city, an intelligent city, versus social inequality. In a country such as ours, Brazil, it is a glaring inequality. Inequality in Brazil reaches rates which are very bad. A society in which the 1% of the richest um, holds about 50% of the national income in their hands. This poses major challenges to thinking, new challenges, the challenge of social inequality. So that's it, Christina. More than a question, it would be giving you a bit of extra time to delve into this relationship between sustainable cities and social inequalities, which in countries such as Brazil is a phenomenon which is very, very strong. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Rogério. Thank you for being here because I know you have just got to where you are and all of the travel you've done is not easy but i think you look great for someone who has spent so long traveling uh -huh, but let's go well your questions answer could give us a dissertation but what i would like to say is firstly when we're speaking about cities a long time ago in brazil maybe 30 years ago, the city was an issue which was uh, uh, treated only by urbanists. As time went by, as the complexity of issues was understood, it was necessarily, it was an issue that became necessarily multidisciplinary. There is no way we can look at cities from one single point of view. So this issue of our high social inequality in Brazil, it even brought up a, a, a phenomena which we, as people who study the issue of cities, hate, but which the, popula the high income population loves. This phenomena is gated communities. These gated communities in which there are walls all around us, a medieval concept comes to fore, which is citadels. This is what citadels were within walls, with their own laws, within their own way of life, and protected from the aggressive external uh, ambience. This concept of a citadel comes up again. 
because uh, the outside environment is aggressive. While we dream of urban environments with parks and urban life in which cities are places where people come together, what we find actually is this phenomena of gated communities, which is firstly uh, comes up with a high income uh, class and now the middle income class because they also dream of gated communities. In the same way that gated communities hold to their own laws, these places where vulnerable, worst off populations live, the so-called slum, also have their laws unto themselves, their own ways of life. So one of the challenges we face is this. We are dealing with two separate worlds in the same territory. So uh, in the pandemic, for example, the issue of the pandemic, at that time I was Secretary of State and uh, I was looking at the decisions and we knew how absurd it was to ask people to stay at home because ha it was absurd for us to ask people not to work, to close down their small businesses because they couldn't leave their homes. And if you allow me, I will take the liberty of speaking as myself, Christina Engel, and not as someone who represents an institution. And we also had a government at the time which was negationist. They denied science. They denied simple measures such as vaccines. They were in denial. So we saw how important, how much easier and how much more important the decisions would made if policies were led by a person, by someone who believes in science. For Brazil, this represented utter chaos. Now, I would say um, the same way that I ended my presentation, uh, I would also say again, we cannot speak about urban sustainability if it is not hand in hand with a search, even if it is you in the utopia, with the search for social equity. We cannot sunder these two things. If we continue on this way in which we have a slum context with their own laws and the gated communities a law unto themselves as well, we are moving forward into barbarianism. If we want to make sure that our societies continues in a desirable uh, way as a society, as a community, we must look to social equity. There is no way, there is no urban solution that can come to terms with that. Thank you. And now let's go back on track to ask for the other two lecturers to answer my questions. Thank you for your question. You have given me a chance to explain okay. my project. You have asked that, what's the possibility that our project go into implementation? Before the pandemic in 2019, the project started, and now it is here now, and it is now not in implementation. The long expansion is due to the pandemic. We have to carry out this project because when we are in Shanghai, we all think about the Nanjing Road and Huaihai Road. They are very powerful business streets, but the truth is that it is not working out effectively because there are many e-commerce online. It is very popular in China, which hugely impact the stores offline. Even in the Nanchang Road and the Huaihai Road, which are the popular streets in the center cities in China, it has still impact greatly. The rent and the profit is degrading. So we must upgrade these streets. We must carry out this project. That's why we are still sticking to it, to revitalize these streets. We have many rounds of designs.
first. As I mentioned, I cannot hear the English translation. We are entering into a new era of transformation. For Shanghai, it cannot expand the city anymore. All it can do is to reform the city, such as the transformation of the traditional commercial areas of the city. It needs a renewal rather than a rebuilding. I think it is our solution, which means for those time honored brands and old buildings, they have the opportunities to be protected rather than being destructed because our national policy also calls for the renewal of time honored brands and old buildings and old districts. And for uh, from another respect, from the policymakers to local people, including all our researchers and the scholars, all of us believe that the old buildings, the old heritages should be protected and reused. It is a consensus of the public, not only the wishes of the planners, they should be protected and used, including those time-honored brands. Our planners, our scholars are only the representatives. We are those who can speak out of what are being thought by our local people. It is not some personal or individual inspirations. It is a common call of the country, of our public. It is the public's wish. So it is our strength. And third, what I want to say is that maybe our solution cannot be fully implemented one by one, but part of them must be implemented. Our project is carried out by the Huangpu Municipal Planning Bureau. The plan in this important district requires many rounds of efforts involving many teams. So it would be an accumulation of efforts of many teams and many efforts. Our design is based on the current situation in China and in Shanghai city. Based on our judgment of the current situation, we have made our plan, which is very practical to the current situation. And I believe that our judgment can satisfy the needs and get the support of the citizens in that area. So this is our basic plan. And our efforts will be combined and integrated with other teams. And then it will come out with the final plan. That's all, thank you. Thank you for your response. Now the floor is to Aka. Can you answer the questions I have mentioned? In the long history of the architecture, Have you paid any attention to the architecture in Chinese history? And can you give us more details in the follow-ups to have more discuss and exchanges? Thank, thank you for the questions. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I am not, uh, I would love to learn from the Chinese history. So basically the they, they, of course, there will be uh, many similarities because of the. Uh, that's why when we have uh, when I started my presentation, I started with the uh, migration, the prehistoric migration. But also, uh, the in the uh, in the wake of a, a civilization building in Indonesia after Austronesian. So Austronesian coming from either Taiwan or from from the mainland uh, Asia. 
But after that, during the uh, 15th centuries, uh, the Indonesian is starting to, to uh, in Indonesia, uh, arrive, uh, start, to, uh, start to accept people coming from uh, India, China, and also from, uh, uh, from the Middle East, from the Arab, just uh, going through the, the uh, spice route. So, so of course, at the, uh, at the end of the day, we would have uh, many assimilation uh, 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 recorded in the, in the cultural heritage that we have today. Uh, now, uh, I'm, I'm uh, more interested in your, uh, in your following questions in, in the sense that uh, how, how do we understand, how can we take uh, what we learn or lesson learned from our local wisdom today, uh, today to, to our today's context. Now, uh, uh, before going there, I, I would like to make a connection first with the, the other two speakers uh, with their wonderful uh, presentations. Uh, uh, first with uh, Professor uh, Christina presentations, uh, which is uh, uh, makes uh, uh, makes a lot of uh, sense even to even to uh, even to me, in the sense where uh, I think that the root problem or, or urban problem uh, obviously is a, a multi-dimensional questions. But if we look into it, the root problem will start with the capital problem. Now, uh, uh, how so? We can uh, maybe. Specifically, we can say that the problem, the urban problem that created a lot of part of our sustainable problem, ecological problem, because, because again, in the level of the scale of the cities, uh, urban civilization today, that's where the, the most of the, uh, uh, the most of the non-sustainability uh, generated is in the cities. So uh, basically, the, the capital problem starts with the change of a business plan, because Everything has a business plan. Even the city has a business plan. The, the city was a project of a public project that suddenly became a private project. If we go close up back to the history, how the, how the city was first created, it was a public project. Then suddenly with the modernism and so on and so forth, it became a private uh, project. Now, actually there's, there's a specific uh, field that we can understand, even if we reread that through the classics, say, uh, through even through Marx or Samir Amin's point of view, or in, in the sense more architecturally into David Harvey's uh, point of view, that the problem is, uh, the capital problem can be translated into agrarian questions. And we've talked about this on to, when we first met. So it was wonderful. I, I got the chance to meet Professor Yan and Dean uh, in I think it was 2016 with uh, with the late uh, uh, professor uh, uh, the late uh, Francois Huta and we talked lengthy on that how the urban question is actually translated into capital problem uh, question which then further on translated into agrarian questions and the thing is that uh, and then um, uh, making connection to to professor uh, 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 professor Yan's pr uh, presentation which is actually aligned to to that logic is that the, the implementation and example of modern space and function that can be taken for granted or or can be learned from the from the old heritage that we have uh, we can make uh, many examples. I'll just give one example that maybe can be connected directly to Professor Yan's presentation is the concept of micro living. Where today is now we're starting to talk about micro living. Everybody's talking about micro micro living, micro house, we works, so on and so forth. Actually, centuries ago, we already experienced that micro living. Now, the micro living is the problem is that when we see the micro living concept, we see it with a different kind of uh, uh, glasses, a point of view. We see micro living as living in the condensed space, which is not true. If we go back to the, to the idea of micro living that we had, micro living is actually having a micro private space with a shared public space. And it's translated very beautifully to Professor Yan's projects because we have the apartments, which is a micro living in a sense. And you, you will have many examples of that, say in, in Hong Kong, for example. But the cityscape itself can be transformed into a public space. Public space, it not, not in the traditional sense of having parks, no. 
but even in the essential, very basic uh, 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 livability kind of public space, like kitchen, for instance, which, which I think is very brilliant. Now, these concepts actually is a common concept if we look back to our history, where you have like many small rooms accommodating different, different families, but and then you have one, one say, shared kitchen. It's an old concept. Now, obviously, we need to translate that back into today's, today's uh, 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 agenda. Oh, okay, so now that's, that's uh, more or less in the, in the middle term, uh, like, like, uh, 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 like it was uh, appointed by Professor Christina, which is, of course, yeah, yes. And obviously, we need a short-term, mid-term, uh, mid and, and long-term kind of solution. Now, uh, back in the 2016, uh, uh, my focus was there. How can we create the short term? And then on the 2017, we have the e-lecture. Uh, I don't know if it's still available. How we can break that down into different kind of strategies based on this uh, understanding of micro, uh, micro private uh, space and shared public space, which is not a micro, it's a city scale. Now, the solution, however, if we're looking back there, the solution is actually already there. Uh, and, I, I, and I really love how, how uh, Professor Christina put forward the difference, like for example, the, uh, uh, the examples of having the gated community, that's actually, it's also that you can date it back to the barbarian, bar barbaric times, which is, which is true. So, now the problem, uh, the question now it, it turns and it, it the uh, the question now is changing and becoming to the question of how do we uh, uh, how do we create a new uh, uh, design for that something that can be implemented uh, uh, directly uh, directly today now and then uh, so the, the the next thing is that the question that we are asking now is a dystopian question. It's something that is too big to be answered uh, using uh, the common methods. I mean, I mean, common methods means that some things that is ready made and, and so on and so forth. And we have so many, uh, uh, so many answers that we already have in architectural work that is not common, including like uh, Professor Yan's examples. It's not a common thing. So those kind of things that we need to explore more now. But the basic thing is that the basic thing is that at first we need to understand and reread the agrarian question in terms of making desegregation between the uh, agrarian question for the capital owners or, or the haves and the agrarian question for the have-nots to be not distinctly different. Like the two examples that I provided, they both the examples of the city in the sky uh, above the mall, the city mall, and the city uh, on the waterfront, which is on the uh, riverfront, is actually both going against the uh, uh, the agrarian law that we have now. But why is it that that when it's uh, implemented for the capital, uh, uh, for for the haves, it becomes okay, and it becomes not okay for the uh, uh, for the other, for the proletarian uh, 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 population. So the only way to, to deal with this is to deal with this business plan first. How we see the city as a business, meaning that the, uh, the, the questions of the land is actually the questions of the price of the land. Now, there are actually spaces or locations in the cities that belongs to the nation or to the state, for instance. Some things that when we say the city as a private project, you cannot really get into it because if in order for us to make the city back in to, to, uh, to make it back into a public domain as a city, we need to liberate these kind of uh, agrarian areas. For instance, the, 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 uh, the land by the rivers, the land by the uh, 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 train rails, and so on and so forth. Those are the lands that belongs to the uh, belongs to the uh, state, and the state needs to use this 
to to uh, to uh, the, uh, the, the state need to use this to liberate uh, the burden of the city, and that's the only way to deal with it. Because when 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 we we, we have a, some something that might be uh, looks like a utopia on the like a hundred years ago, it's actually now it's possible to do. So the so so that's that's the idea. Uh, that that's the kind of things that we should look into. Also, uh, we should also look into, in the sense of to create uh, uh, on the uh, experiments because it's not done yet. So it's experiments on the middle, on the on, on the long term uh, of the city experiments that is actually viable, bankable, and so on and so forth. And to make these projects, say say. Uh, micro leafings for the for for the poor people on the very large scales we can only do that using this kind of uh, location agrarian location that has no value but located like in the middle of the city and that that will be that will turn it into a, a new kind of utopia so the idea is that we are using uh, what is uh, available now Technologically, it's already available, and the only problem to so so it's like this. Let if we simplify the question, uh, the uh, our problems into say, make a one example, social housing in the city center, for example, just for example. Social housing in the city center will never be able, uh, you know, we will never, we will never be able to build social housing in the city center, right? Now, the only problem that why social housing is not buildable in the city center is because of the land plot. That's the only problem. Because uh, uh, bankably, social housing is actually a bankable because it's not so much to, to, to build. The problem lays on the land. So the only way to deal with it is to provide the land that is owned by the state and protected by the law. And it's also also only available for a public affair uh, problems. So those kind of the things that we need to, to look into on the uh, mid to long terms. But if we, uh, to conclude my, uh, uh, my response to the, to the questions, on the longer term, we also need to look elsewhere. And I would say that the, the example that's been given by the Chinese government as one of the major examples that we need to look into. So the longer, the long, very uh, say a very long term solution, actually will not raise, will not stay in the city. We still, we still have other options like rural reconstruction generation, those that been you know, every year we talk about that so we can see the progress that how 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 the China rural reconstruction development is progressing, and how Japan is now trying to do the same. Now, so so we have to. If uh, obviously we have to to if with such a big scale of uh, of problems and questions, we have to do all of them. But uh, uh, nonetheless, I think uh, uh, we need to to have all the uh, uh, available arsenal that we have to to deal with it. And uh, it, I think it's been a pleasure to to share this panel with. Uh, uh, very insightful uh, presentations for the both of you, uh, Professor Christina and Professor Yen. Okay, I, I hope that answer your question, uh, Professor Bin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eka, for your response, answers, and your response to Professor Yen and Professor Christina's presentation. And you also offer us with many potential problem solutions in city developments. You give us many insights, analysis, and you also supplement our webinar. It's like a complete speech. Thank you very much. And here in the chat box, I also noticed that one of our attendee named Simon raised his questions. He says, how viable a multi-generational households in urban environments and a multi-generational households being considered and discussed in architectural discourses. 
first of all, thank you very much. Um, architectural history was actually my favorite subject when studying architecture, so this was great. Um, so Eka just sort of touched upon this question before with micro spaces and public uh, spaces. Um, so one way to achieve more sustainability is through efficiency and specifically efficiency of consumption. Um, so on the social side of things, one of the developments that was designed to boost consumption was the development of the nuclear family um, to create more individual units of consumption, right? Um, and in architectural terms, this presents itself in the extreme of suburbia, right? Um, but urban environments, so, so most apartments are designed uh, to house nuclear families, right? Um, now, on the economic, due to economic pressures, there's a move away from that, um, especially in Hong Kong, right? Um, kids are staying with their parents into a, adulthood, but they're staying in spaces that are not designed for it. Um, so I was wondering if there's um, sort of a move in or discussion in architectural circles towards actually designing urban living spaces to be to house intergenerational families or multi-generational families. Is it even viable? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Simon, for the question. So uh, uh, to be honest, uh, these are one of the things that I am not understanding or I have no knowledge of. But uh, I, I had the chance to study uh, housing in Hong Kong very closely, thanks to Global University for, for 2016 and 2017. And I understand the, the questions that you, you put us through. And those, that question is actually uh, might be uh, uh, unique to only certain places in the world, uh, in, in my opinion. Hence, it needs a, a real hand-on kind of a uh, uh, kind of a solution finder. The thing is that, well, when we talk about the multi uh, the nucleus kind of uh, nucleus kind of family that creates a certain typology of uh, cities, uh, the thing that uh, I think becomes the core the core uh, uh, conceptual problems if we go back to the uh, the, the core of uh, theoretical architecture studies or that teach in the schools is the understanding of having a uh, Siam kind of uh, Siam kind of concepts of having not only nucleus kind of uh, a family but also to respond it with the uh, design of the city with a certain kind of uh, programs, single program cities. So cities with for work, cities for leisure, for specific city to live here. You got the idea. So that's the, the thing that we need to deconstruct fully. And I can learn a lot from Hong Kong how it was forced to be deconstructed. But then, uh, but uh, the next thing is that we, we need to then regenerate the solution that is not part of the original problem. Meaning that if we have the original problem of, uh, the original problem of the CIA model would probably be the transportation problem to going from one place to the others. And then obviously at nighttime during the working days, the city will become empty, those, those kind of things. But now we are facing a different problem. Why? Because we are now facing a cities that is well, some of the cities are forced to be uh, gentrified into hyperdensity kind of cities. So we don't really have the transportation problem for that. But the way that we react that in design sense, we still use the old ways of Siam. I'll give you a, a very basic example to that. We are still building apartment houses not only in Hong Kong, but everywhere that has podium for common programs, lobby and so on and so forth. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the living uh, quarters or li living rooms 
on the towers. That is actually a design that was responding the original Siam's uh, questions. So we need to, even we need to break down those very basic uh, architectural canons that before supposed to be like, you know, everybody understand that and everybody agrees with that. But if we can see from uh, Professor Yan's questions that the ground level, uh, I mean, the public space doesn't have to be in the ground, lo gr uh, ground level only. It can also go up to different levels. And then if you put, if you, if the problem is a, a transportation, meaning circulation from your living quarters, the micro living quarters into the, into the shared space that is not on the ground level, then you build bridge to it. And it doesn't cost that much to build the bridge. The problem is that the willingness to change that very core fundamental uh, 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 theory that's been teach us, teach to us during the architectural school years. Now, so these kind of things we need to explore more. That's that's the thing. But uh, definitely, uh, in in the short term, we need to deal with hyperdensitification, and probably places like Hong Kong or Singapore that will be the, the the places that we need to to pay attention close to because that's where where they are experiencing a different kind of. Uh, different kind of multitude of, of, of problems. Every city, every city has a, uh, problems, but I think some have a different multitudes of problems uh, and Hong Kong and Singapore being some of the highest multitude in problems in, in, in my opinion. But uh, I'm sorry, uh, I cannot mm -hmm. provide a specific answer to your question uh, mm -hmm. about the multi-generational uh, uh, housing. Mm, okay, and um, I would like to invite uh Luo Shi Ying. Um, yeah, she or he has some uh questions. So uh, please speak up. Dear professors, good evening, good morning. I have two questions for Professor Yan, and my questions may also be related to the content provided. The by the other two presenters. My first question is, Professor Yan, how do you feel the deconsumption, the anti-capitalism among Chinese young people? How do you view this transformation? Your case study focuses more on the commercialization of traditional heritage and traditional brands. But in many first tier cities, especially in post pandemic era, Many young people have been moving towards smaller cities like Jingde Town and many southeastern Asian cities. Maybe it has some historical backgrounds because many European people previously had been going to Southeast Asia. They have their bases here in Asia. And they are here providing their yoga training and spiritual living style and consumption. And as I have known recently, some electronics and music show have been booming in Southeast Asia. The city building is quite costly and it is future oriented. Apart from the traditional heritage and the traditional consumption, I think we should also notice the burgeoning new living lifestyle of the young. And my second question is that after the renewal of time honored brands, their operators may still be their elderly organizers and managers. So it goes to another problem, polarization in urban area, as mentioned by Christina, and also the separation of living area and the working area. In China, the old cities are hauling out. All of the old cities in China are witnessing a brain drain. So how do we solve this problem? I think both of your two questions are very excellent. For the first one, the 
anti-consumption and anti-capitalism of the young people in China, it is a trendy phenomenon, especially prominent in the first tier and the second tier cities in China. Not only the young people are fighting against consumption and anti-capitalism, actually, most of the adults in China have the same idea. But personally speaking, I think it has multiple reasons behind. Maybe in the last three decades, China witnessed the rapid development. So the scrutinizing and supervision of huge capital owners are lack. They have many professional policies, but for the common public, we cannot agree on their development and we cannot win a share from their development. So for the huge capital owners, the common public has some negative emotion. And we also have many views of the capitalism, not only the young, but also the other people in China. So personally speaking, why the young people are found to move to the Southeast Asia countries is because they use media more than the elderly people in China. That doesn't mean that elderly people do not favor Southeast Asia countries. It's only because the young can better use internet. It also reflects a downturn economic circle. And the living experience is not that good. So under such circumstance, young people are moving away from the consumptionism. So in this project, I have feel that we cannot solve all the problem in this small part of area. We must have appropriate expectations, but at the same time, we do solve some problems. For example, the phenomenon you have talked about, the young people who move away from the capitalism to consumptionism and moving away to small cities and uh, Southeast Asia country. That is because the living cost is too high and they cannot afford it. So even though they live in the big cities, they cannot enjoy the fruits of the consumptionism in the big cities. So we need to make sure that the young people can afford the costs living in a big city and have a better experience. So I have talked about how can we make the shopping malls who only sell things into uh, immersive experience centers. And for example, if you live in, the, live in Shanghai and you buy a house with uh, two or three rooms, it will be very expensive. But by designing this project where you only uh, buy a small living house, then it will be much cheaper. Then the young people can afford it. What are the, who are the people that their needs are mostly ignored? I think those are the old people and the people who come from other cities to come here to make their own businesses because they don't have their voices heard. So I hope in this project, these people can benefit from our efforts and their voices can be heard and their lives can be seen. So that's our aspiration. For example, in Shanghai, many elder people have their children studying and living abroad, and they're living in Shanghai alone. And it's difficult for them to take care of themselves, and they do not have people to talk with. They're very lonely. 
and we cannot hear their voices in the social media. So how can we meet their needs? And we don't want them to be driven into the suburbia by this modernized and commercial cities. And the government support us in our thinking. They support that the old people should live in these cities and enjoy the city life. So how can we meet their needs? For example, they used to live in small spaces. They hold many things in their houses. So what do we do? We developed underground spaces. For example, we have some green spaces in the streets, and then we build underground to put their things. And we can make some shopping malls underground. And the profits can be used in building these infrastructures and we can use the underground spaces as a common storage space. And this space can be free for those old people. So for the old people whose houses were occupied by the, by the things they hold, are now moved to the common storage center. So their living space is bigger. And for youngsters, they don't need such a large space to stay, to live in. So we move the kitchens and the study rooms into a common space so they can afford their small houses. And for old people, they cannot cook by themselves, so they can go to this common kitchen. And these old people can meet the young people and they live together because they cook in the same kitchen. So this is comp a company. The old people can live together and have their a company of the youngsters lives by. Yeah. So this is our aspiration and thinking that benefits um, both the old and young people. Um. Uh. Because of the time limit, we have to close the webinar, and so I would like to invite the uh free speaker to give the last remarks in one minute. So uh, Eka first. Okay, thank you for the uh, opportunities. Uh, I think it's it's been like a very wonderful uh, and, uh, sessions, and it actually connected. You know, uh, the, the all the presentations actually connected. So I think we uh, the, the things that we just need to look uh, uh, outside the box, like Christina has. Said. Okay, thank you. I think it's all from. Well, first of all, it was I would like to thank a lot for this possibility. I was once in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong, and I learned a lot. And now I learn more, even more, with these, with these talks and presentations, and in this globalized world, that I talked about a lot about the difference. But we also know that we we have similar problems, and that this is essential that we are connected and we collaborate, and this enables us to work together and to have this connection and this exchange of ideas and experiences of, of knowledge. And I hope that this does not end in this webinar and that we have instruments to extend the, these understandings. Thanks a lot. Thanks for everyone, for all the attendees. Final remarks. Thank you, Christina and Eka. Thank you for your wonderful speeches. And thank you for all those wonderful questions. I believe that in every country and every city, they have their own management methods. And we need to propose our specific methods based on our own cities and countries. And we have to do it 
based on the specific situations. But when we think in a macro way, we can see there are many similar problems and needs. So with this opportunity, we can build a long-term connection and see other situations and have a better communication and promote better management and design in those cities. Thank you. Thank you. I'm the moderator today, so I want to give some ending remarks. I'm sorry for my flu that I stopped in the middle. And here I want to continue. In this forum, we have talked about cultural heritage and the buildings. And I believe that this communication is only a start. And as a global citizen, we can have more opportunities to talk about our problems, especially in this global EU platform, and to pay more attention to the citizens, especially the vulnerable groups, and give them better lives and make our efforts in promoting these programs. And I believe that everyone deserves an equal and good lives. I hope that our communication can be sustainable in this Global EU platform. And thank you very much, very much Mr. Uh, Professor Jianzhi and Xie Cui and all the efforts of the team can give up us this opportunity to have this communication. This is only a start. We will have more opportunities to cooperate and communicate and work together forward. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for the three lectures, for your inspiring talks. And that's for tonight. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.